In this part of the course we will look at classification. First of all at unsupervised classification and afterwards at supervised classification. So we generally try either to find groups in the data or we search for rules in the data set that predict why an object belongs to a certain group. The first learning targets are to gain some knowledge on clustering, me clustering methods and aims and to understand hierarchical and non-hierarchical cluster analysis. Here you have the review questions, the study questions related to the different learning targets. So go through them after you went through the video and check whether you picked up everything that is expected from you to pick up. We start with unsupervised classification. In unsupervised classification we don't know whether the data has a group structure and we search for a potential group structure that is not known a priori. So we want to identify hidden structures or grouping of similar observations. And you see a graph that's displaying what we mean by that. Note that these examples that I provide here are just serving the purpose of illustration and they are not based on real data. So don't take these for some ecotoxicological truth. On the left hand side we see that we have identifiable groups. We have the chloride atoms in the molecule against the toxicity pro nanogram biomass of animals and we can see that when chlor chloride ad atoms are added to the molecule that you have some stepwise jump in the toxicity. So Toxicity is relatively similar between 8 and 11 molecules. Then it jumps when you have about 13 up to a higher level of toxicity. That remains more or less the same. And then once you reach 22 molecules of chloride in, in uh, atoms of chloride in the molecule, in the complete substance, then toxicity increases to a new level. In the right figure we see that we have for fluoride atoms we see no relationship between the atoms in the molecule and the toxicity and we couldn't identify any groups in this case. Overall unsupervised classification methods have been developed for different purposes and there are different methods available. One of the most prominent methods is cluster analysis that is, it has a longer history than many other of the novel methods. Novel methods include for example self-organizing maps but we limit our discussion to cluster analysis. So cluster analysis has many applications. One of the applications we have already discussed, it is used to identify groups. That's not surprisingly, that's the aim of unsupervised classification, one of the main aims. And for example, we could look for groups of plants that have some similar characteristics, but are different in these characteristics to other organisms for, or other objects of the same type. For example, plants that grow very much and we want to distinguish them from plants that are slow growing or animals that are herbivores and we want to distinguish them from omnivores and predators or parasites. We could also look, or look at genes and try to identify genes with a similar expression patterns and cluster analysis is actually used in all these contexts. 
Then it can be used for data aggregation. For example, if we want to reduce the noise in the data set, we can replace the individual observations in the data by the group centroid. So if you look at the circles or the ellipses that we have created on the figure, the blue, yellow and red, you could replace the individual observations by just the mean, by the center of these data and use that in subsequent analysis. You lose some sample size, but you gain some, you gain some more, you reduce the noise in the data. In addition, we will show you that through cluster analysis you can reduce the dimensions of the data. For example, in the dendrogram. And this dendrogram can all, is also a way to visualize the distances or similarities between objects in a two-dimensional space. And this is very helpful and an alternative to ordination in case that we have really a grouping structure in the data. Finally, we could use cluster analysis to identify outliers. For example, if we establish groups and we see that some of the points are deviate strongly from each of the other groups or clusters that have been developed or established, then we could treat these points as outliers in the data set. In the notes to the slide, you will find some literature hints where you could look for additional material to read about cluster analysis for ecological data, for example, Wildi 2010, or a modern treatment of cluster analysis is provided in Everett et al. 2011. You will also find this textbook on the literature list related to this course. So how does cluster analysis work? Cluster analysis relies on the similarity or distance matrix. We have discussed different distance measures in the previous session. So you should be acquainted with that. And you want to maximize the within group similarity of objects in the cluster or to, at the same time to minis, minimize the between group similarity. So to have clusters that are on the one hand very homogeneous and on the other hand are separated very well from other groups or clusters. And these results depend on the similarity or distance measure that is used and that is actually the main problem of cluster analysis because you need not only to calculate similarity or distance between objects that is it's quite handy, we have done that, although you know that when there's a wide range of different distance measures or similarity measures that could be used and obviously the choice of these measure influences the results, but we also need somehow to calculate the distance between objects and the cluster itself. And how this is done is discussed in a few minutes. We have several different types of cluster analysis and we will first start with hierarchical agglomerative clustering. Hierarchical agglomerative clustering is widely used in many different fields of science. It's called agglomerative because it's agglomerating the individual objects with each step. So if you have, for example, different species where you want to find feeding groups, then in each step of this cluster analysis, two species are merged together and form a new cluster. And subsequently, this cluster may have an additional species added. So in the end of this clustering, all species are part of 
of the same or are, have been assigned to a cluster and in the hierarchical divisive clustering would be the opposite. It starts with one big group and builds smaller groups out of that in each, in each step. So it breaks apart smaller clusters from that. So this may be useful if you're searching for outliers because outliers form their own group um, in the, and at first in this kind of analysis. So in hierarchical agglomerative clustering, we start with all objects as single clusters and then they are merged into a joint cluster based on the distance or similarity. And how this is done exactly, we will discuss now. So how does hierarchical agglomerative clustering work? We show you an example here of some data where we have produced a distance matrix that is displayed here. We have six different objects, so let's say we have six different sites and some character characteristics have been measured in them. For example, some species or environmental variables such as the temperature or pH. And we calculated the distance between them based on the Euclidean distance or for species on the Bray Curtis distance. And we see here the given distances. So what we, what we do in cluster analysis, we first search for the shortest distance between two objects, or generally in cluster analysis in hierarchical agglomerative clustering. And we merge these two pairs of objects into a cluster. If we look at the distances here of the matrix, we see that 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 have the shortest distances. And in the first step, it's then rather random whether you merge 2 and 3 or 1 and 2. There may also be additional digits of the distances where these two are, can be discriminated. We see that 2 uh, and 4, 2 and 5, 2 and 6 have higher distances and 3 and 4, 3 and 5, 3 and 6 have also different or much higher distances and what we now do is we merge 2 and 3 into one cluster. Now that we have created a new cluster we see that we only have five objects in our headers for the columns and for the rows. So we have one, we have the cluster two, three, and we have four, five, six. And now this is the challenge that I mentioned. How do we now calculate the distance between the cluster two, three and the individual objects one, four, five, and six? Well, if you look at the initial distance matrix, we see that, for example, to the object, to the site 1, site 2 had a distance of 1.4 and site 3 had a distance of 2. So what is the distance of 2 and 3 after merging? We see here that the distance is 1.4 and it's not difficult to identify that this is the lowest distance of the two individual distances, so of two and three. And we could go on and check this for other observations. For example, the distance of, of two and six was 5.3. and The distance of three and six was five. Now the distance of two and three is the lower one of these two. It is five. So what you do is you recalculate the distances and then you go back to step one. That means you search for the shortest distance between pairs of objects and merge them into an, a, an additional cluster. So what you would see here is the shortest distance of two and three is the one, is the distance two 
the, uh, to the site 1. So we would merge the cluster 2 and 3 with site 1, but in other circumstances, for other cases, it could also be that, for example, object 4 and 5 would be closest and then we would form an additional cluster 4 and 5 and we had another grouping then 2 and 3 and we would need to calculate the distance between the cluster 2, 3 and the cluster 4, 5. And this all and this whole stepwise procedure ends when all objects are merged into one cluster. And this is displayed here, what is meant by that. It may be counterintuitive at the beginning that all objects are merged into one cluster, but see what we mean by this. In hierarchical agglomerative clustering, we have stepwise clustering, so in each step, two objects are merged. So have a look at this figure. So what we see are, let's say again, five sides. 212, 214, 233, and so on. And the distance between the sides are on the x-axis. Now, the, the, the two sides, 212 and 213, 14 seem to be closest, so they are merged first. Then we go the next step, where 431 and 432 are merged. And in the next step, then we merge 233 with the cluster 432 and 431. Again, keep in mind that we are not looking at the distance between 233 and each of the individual points, but between the cluster 432, 431. And after we have done this, we merge this cluster of the three points now, 432, 431, and 233, with our first cluster, 212, 214, and now all objects are, are merged into one big cluster. And you can see the distance is almost one. That, that means between the, the cluster 212, 214, to the other cluster, there's almost no similarity. So note the similarity in the, in the interpretation to a phylogenetic tree. In the phylogenetic tree here, you have the time on the x-axis against the development of new organisms. And we see that many of the primates and some rodents share a similar ancestor. So they have been merged. So if you move from right to left, they all are merged. And in the end, they are having a common ancestor. So rabbits and humans share a common ancestor. But the similarity is, of course, not between, if you move along that, is not between the Guinea, Guinea pig and humans directly but between ancestors that have been that have been living throughout evolutionary history and from these ancestors you have breakups of new species and that's very similar to cluster analysis where we don't look for example when we when we look at the joint ancestors for humans and rabbits we need to look at the, at the similarities between the whole cluster of some primates and monkeys and some rodents. And that's not the direct similarity between the humans and the guinea pigs or the, between the rabbits. And that's a similar interpretation may help to keep in mind what we have discussed about the cluster dendrogram. And here's an example from 
A study where hierarchical agglomerative clustering has been applied. The question has been what are the functional feeding groups and canyon freshwater invertebrates, so many streams were sampled, the organisms identified, and afterwards they used the different the different species, uh, better the characteristics of the species was was the gut content here, they looked what the species had eaten and they used this to calculate distances between species which were then put into cluster analysis to identify groups and we see here that they came up with some grouping structure based on the feeding of the origin of the, of the invertebrates and that can be helpful in ecological analysis. And we see that in some of the groups they are relatively succinct and homogeneous where clusters are built and some are relatively heterogeneous. For example, if you look at the scrapers and compare them to the predators, for example, you see two groups of predators, but within the individual group of predators, if you move to the left, you barely see, but there is merging of clusters, so they are fairly similar. So we have already discussed that one of the challenges in hierarchical agglomerative clustering is that we need to calculate distances between the clusters or between objects and clusters. And how do we do this? And there are three different methods that are displayed on this slide. So on the one hand you have the average linkage. That means if you have two clusters that are visualized here by 1 and 2 is seen as one cluster and 4, 5, 6 is seen as one cluster. Then you take all the distances between 1 and 4, 1 and 5, 1 and 3 and so on and you compare and the distances between 2 and 4, 5 and 3 and so on. You calculate all individual distances between the point and you take the average. So it's the average distance between all individual objects in the clusters. On the other hand, as you have seen before, we could take the shortest distance between the objects. So if you have a cluster A and B as shown on the right hand side, we have a couple of points in each cluster and we take the shortest distance between the two clusters. So the point that have the shortest distances provide the distance between the cluster A and the cluster B. On the other hand, we could also say, well, let's take the points that are most distance, distant between cluster A and cluster B and take this as the, the distance between cluster A and cluster B. That's called complete linkage. Another method is the so-called Wards method. Here we have some similarity to the analysis on, of variance because what we do is we try to minimize the within cluster sum of squares. And how is this calculated? Well, we calculate the center of the individual points in the cluster, so the average, and then we calculate the distance of each individual member from this centroid and square the distances to this centroid and take the sum of that. So you are used to this, of doing this from analysis of variance, where you do this for groups. Now, the different methods of clustering have influence on the result of the clustering. For example, the average linkage is space conserving. The 
Single linkage is space contracting and the complete linkage is rather space dilating. What does this mean? Space conserving, space constructing and space dilating. It means when we look at the original distances between objects and at the distances between objects in the clusters for space conserving met metrics, we have a very similar distances between the original distances and the distances after clustering. And we can calculate the distances with the so-called cofinetic matrix and that's shown to you in R. We can also compute the so-called stress 1. We have discussed this metric in the context of NMDS. So go back to the NMDS discussion to see the formula for this goodness of fit measure. And this would be lower, lowest for the average linkage compared to the single or complete linkage because here we have the most similar or we have the highest preservation of conservation of the initial distances. So if we want to preserve the initial distances, then this is the method of choice. On the other hand, you have space contracting methods that's used if we want to have very succinct clusters so objects, it, it, so this approach adds objects to clusters even if this leads to shorter distances between clusters than between objects in the raw data. So we aim at building very, so we would build larger groups because we end, we add all objects that are close to any of the members in the cluster. And this can be used, for example, to find discontinuities in the data. Because if we have some clusters where all objects are further, far apart, then this can be identified with this method. Because if any of the objects is close to one of the objects in the other cluster, that would be then merged based on space contracting methods. Space delighting is the exact opposite. This approach minimizes the distances of the objects within the cluster. So clusters are really homogeneous because you always, as a distance between two clusters, you always take the distance of the most distance, most distant objects or between clusters or a cluster and an object and this guarantees that only objects are added to clusters that are very similar to the remaining objects in the cluster. So if you want to find very homogeneous groups in your data this is the method of choice. So here you see an example where we use some ecological site data and where some organisms have been measured and we used two different methods, a single linkage and a complete linkage to build cluster. And what you see is that for the single linkage relatively quickly look at the y-axis here, that's the distance it's called height here, it's the distance between the objects, we see that at the distance of 0.01 almost all of the objects have been, of the sites, have been merged into one cluster. And you see that three sites 10, 24 and 20 are really different to all the other sites. So you could use this to identify outlines. You could say, well, these are really discontinuous compared to all of the other sites. So you obtain large and close clusters. On the other hand, you have complete linkage. 
it's shown on the bottom figure. Note that we have a very different scale of the y-axis here. So the, the, when most objects are merged into a group, we have a tenfold higher distance or height in this dendrogram. And we see that we have many, many small and more distant clusters that have been established. So if we are more interested in more homogeneous cluster, then we should take this. Note that anyway, we also would identify the 20 and 24 as well as 10 are relatively distant to the other sites in the data set. So there would be some similarity in the results. We have so far discussed hierarchical agglomerative clustering. Cluster analysis actually consists of many different methods. And first you can distinguish do we place all objects into one cluster only or do we allow objects to be part of multiple clusters. That would be fuzzy clustering, it's called non-exclusive clustering and it's described in Everett et al. We don't discuss this in detail here. If we only go along this, this line or go along the line of exclusive clustering, that means objects can only be part of one cluster. And then we have non-hierarchical and hierarchical clustering. Hierarchical clustering is clustering where clusters are arranged in a stepwise procedure. So you have clusters merged at one stage and in the next step another cluster is merged or other objects are merged. So you have the stepwise until at the end all of the objects are part of one big cluster or, of, or each has one single cluster. And that's the distant difference between agglomerative clustering, where you start with each object in one cluster or one own group and you merge them, or with divisive, hierarchical divisive clustering, where you would start with one big group and break up into smaller groups. So hierarchical agglomerative clustering is what we have discussed so far. What we will discuss now which is different to that, is non-hierarchical clustering. And this is used to look at maximum. It also looks at maximum within cluster homogeneity, homogeneity, but there is no clear relationship between the cluster. There is no stepwise procedure, so we come up with one partition of the objects in the different clusters, but we don't obtain the steps that led to this result because the algorithm is very different. So we don't have a stepwise procedure here. We will discuss when you should use what after we have discussed k-means or non-hierarchical cluster analysis. So non-hierarchical cluster analysis, there are different types, the most or different, different methods. And the most widespread one is the k-means clustering. It's not necessarily the, more, the best one, but if you understand that, you will understand its, its uh, descendants that came, have been developed later on. We will show you later on one of the slides, some additional techniques uh, that can be used if you have different uh, problems or research questions that cannot be answered by k-means clustering. So it assigns objects to a predefined number of clusters, so that's very different to the previous clustering method. In the previous clustering method, we could, if we, we could cut 
this hierarchical tree wherever we want and then have a number of cluster uh, that we wish to have. Here we assign objects to a predefined number of clusters. So we need to define before that we want to have three groups or four groups or five groups or whatever. And that is the problem because if in the example here some numbers are given, if we have for example 15 objects and partition them between three groups, there are all already two million different possible partitions. Now, if we have a sample size of 100, which is not unlikely, so you often have 100 samples and you have all five groups, then the number of possible partitions becomes incredibly large. So we cannot calculate all possible partitions. This becomes unsurmountable even for relatively small sample size. So we need an algorithm that does this for us and finds a solution or an alternative to calculating all possible partitions. So we need an algorithm that helps us to find a solution to this problem. And this algorithm is the, in the k-means clustering as outlined here. We first partition all objects into k groups, then we move objects between groups and calculate a change in a cluster criterion. Then we compare the cluster criterion between the initial situation and the situation after we move the object, so we calculate whether the change improved or decreased the quality of the cluster criterion. And we repeat this until we have no visible change anymore in the cluster criterion. So we need to have a criterion that tells us does the clustering become better or does it become worse when we, when we put place points in different clusters? So it's clear that this, or given the waste amount of possibilities for partitioning, it's clear that we don't find the best solution necessarily if we just start with one type of assignment of of, of objects into different groups. So we need an other. So the algorithm needs to be started multiple times with a random partitioning into the desired number of groups. In, in fact, you could also use a non-random partitioning, for example, the result of a hierarchical cluster analysis as a starting point. So which criterion can be used to assess what is the best solution and to assess how change affects the clustering? Well, that's again the minimization of the within cluster sum of squares. So we want to have to move objects into one cluster that are very similar, that have a low distance and this distance is measured of the sum of squares within clusters. And note here the analogy to the Ward's method in hierarchical and non agglomerative clustering and to analysis of variance that I mentioned before in the context of the Ward's method. K-means clustering implicitly relies on the Euclidean distances when the sum of squares are calculated. So if you want to use it for ecological data, this requires some data preparation, for example, transformation of the data so that the Euclidean distance can be used with that. We discussed the problems of the Euclidean distance for the ecological data in a previous lecture on similarity measures. Now after that we have done 
all the clustering either with k-means or with the hierarchical agglomerative clustering, one question certainly remains and that is how many clusters do we really have? So we could, if you imagine a, a study where we had observed the different sites and the, uh, the environmental variables like pH, temperature and nutrient concentrations and so on in the sites. We could run on hierarchical agglomerative clustering. That would show us in a dendrogram how the different objects are merged. But in the end they are all merged into one cluster. And where do we draw the line? Where do we say, well, that's the number of clusters that we want to have. We could do this visually looking at the dendrogram. For a k-means clustering, it's even different. We have to provide a number of clusters before. But what is a good number of clusters? Is it 4, 5, 10, 20? So we need to have a criterion, and these are called cluster validity indices, that allows us to compare the validity of the clustering between different number of clusters. Now, you can imagine that there's a wide range of criteria again and we can't go into all details of these individual criteria here. Just you should be aware that these criteria, there is no one size fits all, but they have different scopes. One, one are better to evaluate homogeneity of the classes, other put more weight on the separation between clusters. Others look at uniformity of the different clusters, so that you have clusters that are relatively uniform in their homogeneity or separation. Then some, for, uh, some evaluate the representation of the raw data and others the stability. So how stable is the solution if you have change, if you had changes in the raw data. You should not overinterpret individual criteria and be aware that all of these serve different purposes. So we cannot discuss them thoroughly here. We will just give a few examples of cluster validity indices and how they work. On the one hand, you have so called internal cluster validity indices and well. From now on, just call them CVIs. Internal ones, they, do, they compare different cluster solutions. You run k-means for four, five, or six clusters, or you run a hierarchical agglomerative clustering, and you say, well, I compare the results for four, five, or six groups that I cut from the same dendrogram. And you have external CVIs, and they are used if you knew before that there is a certain grouping structure. For example, we know that some of the sites have an agricultural context and other sites have a context of urban sites and other sites are from the forest and we have a previous grouping structure. We could check whether the grouping structure that we have externally given, for example, sites in the forest and agriculture and urban landscapes, resembles the resulting cluster structure. These CVIs that are used here are so-called external CVIs. Now we discuss the first internal CVI. And this index is called saliniski harabs This index calc is, is similar to ANOVA. Remember that in ANOVA you calculate the sum of squares within and the sum of squares between. And this is similar in this index. If you look at the picture you see, or in the figure, the right bottom, you see uh, four clusters. Each of the cluster is, is, has a C. CI is the cluster on the top left, CJ is the cluster on the bottom right. Then you see an X with an overline 
and this indicates the total mean of all data points that's the right point in the center and then you see red points within each cluster these are the centroids that's the lower C that indicates these points and the number of points in each clusters is n so the number of observations now what you do and without going too much into details of the few formula for calculating the salinsky harabj index the ch index which we'll just refer to in the following is you calculate the within cluster sum of squares so you take each observation and you calculate the distance to the centroid within each cluster and this will then be squared and you calculate the sum between clusters and for that you take the center of all data which is indicated by the x over line in the, the red point in the center of all clusters and you calculate the distance from this one to all observations and then you have the formula where you divide the between cluster sum of squares by the within cluster sum of squares and it should be quite obvious what this uh, that how the goodness of fit is indicated uh, it's clear that the higher the ch index the better the clustering is then because the clustering you want to minimize the within cluster sum of squares and you want to maximize the between cluster sum of squares. So a higher salinsky harabj index is better. That means if you calculate this index for a couple of for different cluster solutions, let's say one, one for, for hierarchical clustering, you have four, five, six, or seven, or for k-means, you have four, five, six, seven groups selected, then you can compare these groups with the CH index and you would select the group that shows the maximum CH. So the number of groups that shows the maximum CH. It, an index that follows a different approach is the so-called gap index. It's also an internal CVI. And while that, this looks again based on the formula a little bit difficult you have that it's it's actually quite simple what it does it it calculates the difference in the sum of squares within clusters so SSV um, between the data and between the reference distribution that means that initially what the algorithm does that calculates its index it determines a uniform reference distribution via bootstrapping so it doesn't assume a particular no, a normal distribution or whatever but but every value within the range of the data of the original data has the same probability of being selected that's a uniform distribution normal distribution would have a mean and the further you are away from the mean the lower the probability would be to be selected as a value so with this uniform distribution you calculate as well the sum of squares within for the clustering and you compare the results between these pure random data and between the data uh, that that originates or of the clustering that originates from your original data and what you can see is in the figures below if you if you plot the observation the number of clusters of the observations and the sum of squares within and for the reference distribution e that you have a difference between the these both between both distribute between the the values for the reference distribution and for the original data. For example, if we look at four clusters in the, in the left bottom plot 
you see that the log of the within cluster sum of squares is about four, but the log for the reference distribution clustering is about five. So there's one one log unit difference between them. And what we now look for, we search for the pair of observation and reference distribution data that has the highest dif difference. And this is actually shown on the right hand side where you see that the strongest distance is given for two clusters and so that's the 1.5 log units difference in between the uniform random distribution and between the original data and yeah you would select two clusters in this case because you have the highest gap value the highest distance between this um, reference distribution and the original data clustering Another internal CVI is the silhouette width S and this relies on the dissimilarities of an observation to or the dissimilarity of an observation to the other objects in the same cluster compared to the average dissimilarity of objects in the nearest neighbor cluster. So this indicated by the figure below, you take an observation xe and you calculate within the same cluster the dis this dissimilarity the distances the distances and take the average of that one and you do the same in this case the nearest neighboring cluster would be cj you calculate for xy X, xe the distances to the individual points in the cluster cj and take the average and it's somehow obvious that if the average dissimilarity with clusters with their own cluster is higher than the average dissimilarity to clusters to another cluster, then it would be better to actually place it, this observation in, the, in, the, in a different cluster. So ideally, all of the silhouette width would be larger than zero because if it's smaller than zero it means based on the formula based on that the average dissimilarity with the observations in the own cluster is is higher than this similarity with observations from other from another cluster and this is expressed in the equation that you see here and the denominator in the equation scales the value and it's relatively similar if you compare it to the Bray-Curtis distance how the scaling is done with the maximum here. Um, we won't, don't want to go into more details here uh, of the equation. So what represents uh, good silhouette width for an individual point has already been mentioned. If the point approaches 1, it's very well classified. It if it approaches minus 1, it's, it is misclassified. And if it's around 0, the silhouette width for a point, then it's unclear where this point should be placed. Now, if you don't want to, you know, no, typically you don't want only to evaluate the results for an individual point, but for the whole cluster solution, if you're using, for example, different number of clusters, you want to compare them, and that's 
where you can use the average silhouette width. And if you use this index, you calculate the average of all silhouette width over the observations. And the higher this silhouette width it becomes, the better the clustering is according to this index. So you would select the number of clusters that yield to the highest number for S for the, for the average silhouette width. And if this absolute value of the silhouette width is above 0.5, this suggests that you have a reasonable clustering. If the value is below 0.2, this actually would suggest that there is a lack of cluster structure. And finally, a concept that you have visited before is bootstrapping. And bootstrapping can be used to assess the cluster stability. So what you do is you draw bootstrap samples for the original data. So you create 100 additional samples, for example. Then you compute the clustering for the orig original data and for the bootstrap data. So that follows approximately the a similar distribution as the original data. And then you calculate the Jacquard index. So the Jacquard index can, uh, can be used. You know, it's an index for presence absence data. And this is actually in this case, you have a presence or a one is used if you have the same cluster solution for the original data and the bootstrap data. And if the observations are placed in different clusters, then this yields to a zero. And to evaluate the overall cluster stability, the, the mean of the Jacquard index across all pairs of original data and bootstrap data can be used. If this mean of the Jacquard index is higher than 0 .0, 0, 0.75, then this can be regarded as a good stability. If it's lower, it may be less stable, but this will also depend on the sample size, as you will see in the R script. So with larger sample size, it's easier to obtain a stable clustering than with a lower sample size. But it's also obvious because if you just move one individual point, and this has a stronger effect if you have few samples than you have many samples. And the final index is an external CVI. So assume that we have a grouping structure that, it, that is known beforehand. So we can use this, this to compare the result of our clustering to the external the grouping structure to the external data that is provided. And when you look at the index, the so-called RAND index, the index is the same as the simple matching coefficient that we had when we discussed similarity measures and distance measures in the previous session. So there's nothing new here. You see also the table has just been adjusted. Instead of species presence absence, we look at cluster results and external data. So you have the A, if you have the same class in the external data and it's placed in the same cluster in the cluster results. If, if a pair is placed in a different class in the external data and in a different cluster for the clustering results, it's D. So these are the true positives and the true negatives. And then of course you have also false positives and false negatives. There's also one uh, adjusted RAND index that's adjusted to yield zero for two random partitions. So that's what we use in the R software, but for us it doesn't matter here how this more complicated index is calculated. 
So finally, some notes on using cluster analysis. You may have realized that cluster analysis remains at least partially subjective and that there are many different choices that can be used or even be misused. It's certainly a valuable tool for exploratory analysis in different fields, but it lacks formalization. So there is no clear guideline what to do and for different data sets, different approaches or methods may come to better solutions and different choices uh, that you have for, for example, uh, the met different methods associated with hierarchical clustering influence the outcome and it depends always on the research question. You can also, when you look at the examples that we deal with in the R demonstration, you will see that the results are often not that straightforward. So it's a rather exploratory, explorative technique. You, you rarely, or depending on the data set, you cannot expect to come to really clear solution with different, if you would compare the solutions for different methods and for different clustering indices. So it really depends on your research question, on your aim and what you want to do. It generally has a tendency to detect specific kind of clusters or so spherical clusters. Some other clusters may not that easily be detected. Well, and you might, might ask, well, when should you use k-means and when should you use hierarchical clustering? Well, as a few general comments on this choice, k or a narrow k range of k, if this is known, so if you know there are a few groups in the data and you can narrow this range down, then you should use k-means if you really have knowledge on the number of groups. Or for example, let's say we have obtained remote sensing data from, the, from some satellite mission on the Earth's surface and we want to classify the land cover in different land cover classes, then we might know beforehand and we want to have 10 different classes and we can use this for selecting the group, so the group assignment in k-means. On the other hand, if we want to see how the cluster steps, how the clustering is done in a stepwise procedure because we're interested in the pairwise comparison of objects and how these are merged along the clustering and we want to visualize the clustering in the dendrogram, yeah, then we should surely use the hierarchical clustering. Hierarchical clustering is also generally more flexible, so it allows the use of different distance measures and different clustering methods, whereas k-means is restricted to the Euclidean distance and to the sum of squares. However, there is an alternative to k-means that, uh, that we will see that we will see on the next slide that is a little bit more versatile than k-means itself. And if you have very, very large data sets with 10,000, 100,000, millions of entries, then k-means is actually much more efficient in computation and hierarchical clustering may take too long for computation. I want to end with a quote from Everett et al. that you will also find in the note to the slide. The methods of cluster analysis can be a valuable tool in the exploration of multivariate data. Applying the methods in practice, however, requires considerable care if overinterpretation is to be avoided. Simply applying a particular, a particular method of cluster analysis and accepting the solution at face value is in general not adequate. And finally, an overview with the related R package on some further techniques and cluster analysis. So an alternative to k-means that is open to alternative distance metrics and is non-Euclidean is partitioning around Medoids. 
Then we have the non-hierarchical clustering for large data sets that is much more efficient. So what is large depends on the number of variables and objects as well as, well as the processing power of computer, but certainly not the typical environmental data sets from, an, from field observations that we are dealing with. Then you have model-based clustering. This estimates model parameters from the data and assumes a specific cluster structure. So it's rather a statistical model that is employed here and it also features hypothesis testing within this model-based clustering. If you are interested in this more formal procedure, so because we have what we have done so far was rather using cluster analysis in a more exploratory, exploratory fashion, then you should look into model-based clustering. And finally, there's variable clustering. So this can be useful to identify multicollinearity. So you can also visualize the collinearity between variables using var class function in the hmisc package. Or you can could even use surrogate variables for highly collinear variables. You could calculate surrogate variables, and that's done by the h class var function in the cluster of var package. So these are all techniques that you may want to explore depending on the research questions that you have.